go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back or welcome to the first time to session 27 in our series. Uh, what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, as many of you know, we started these in late March in response to the declaration of the pandemic when the question just became self-evident, you know, well, okay, everything is closed. So what does it mean? What are, what are the various aspects we've explored around that question since then? And it's been more or less every week, uh, internet access, which is of course, one of the important services that libraries provide, public libraries, uh, digital services, even more important is that demand for that has, ex has exploded uh, as is uh, predictable. Physical materials, of course, another thing that uh, stopped almost completely and now has begun to uh, restart and spaces are slightly opening. Uh, the expectation is like with other institutions, open, close, open a little bit, close back down, reopen. We're just gonna have to find out. <clears throat> and then the other aspect we've ex explored with this is uh, uh, social infrastructure, the role that libraries play in community cohesion and and a whole range of topics that flow through this, uh, this precious institution, uh, infrastructure, access, speech, privacy, education, you name it. Uh, there's just almost nothing, uh, no social uh, aspect that doesn't uh, relate to the library or vice versa. Uh, this image we borrowed from the internet without attribution, uh, uh, we hope it's okay, is, is kind of representative of, of what's happening. And the, the nation is tattered and it's uh, struggled to define itself, uh, but it's still flying, I guess we can say. Uh, slide, please, Stephen. So uh, we're going to spend the hour today, uh, the first hour recorded, and then we'll hang out for another half an hour for that just for you know, overrun and, and chit chat uh, or open questions. Um, we're, we've got two great speakers today that'll help us kind of make sense of, uh, of the prospects for the change in the political landscape, the policy landscape as a result of the election. So what will this mean? And so this gives us a chance to start to think about beyond uh, 2020, which I think a lot of people are anxious to do, uh, and also uh, libraries in recovery, which is the, the kind of the subtitle of the of the series. Uh, we went from the first, you know, kind of WTF, what's going on, and then uh, we we called it libraries in response, uh, which is of course still relevant because things are still happening and are gonna for a long time. Uh, but it's also now we're thinking about recovery and we're thinking through this thing about new design and responses and service shifts and all kinds of things that are not simply reactive, but now uh, trying to be initiated as, as a positive step. Slide, please. So this is one more slide. Uh, this is, did you, did you go, go, go back one, please. I'm sorry. I think I skipped our introduction. Excuse me, Stephen. Uh, so we are the Gibbet Libraries Network. We're producing this series. Uh, we're an open consortium of, of uh, uh, libraries that have been doing innovative things with technology. Most of our focus has been around connectivity. Uh, since we initiated Fiber to the Library as a campaign in 2007, saying that every, that, that the least expensive, most expedient and equitable way to deliver next generation broadband into every community is to run gigabit fiber to all 17,000 libraries facilities as a, as, a, as a double win for both uh, a priority population as an endpoint where one in three adults accesses or did before the virus uh, hit accesses the internet at a library. It's a phenomenal number, 80 million people. And, uh, and then the added benefit of that approach is that you've extended the physical infrastructure deeper into these communities or markets. And if it's done properly, then those could be leveraged for last mile interconnections. 
uh, which is uh, kind of a topic that we may take up in a little while because it's uh, uh, it's, it's kind of relevant to policy questions. Uh, these sessions are being hosted and recorded by our partner, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions with uh, Stephen Weiber at the controls there in the Netherlands. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, this has been a great, uh, great partnership and collaboration. Uh, slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the latest map. Everybody presumably on the planet is following this, uh, this election. Uh, we just had Georgia and Pennsylvania turn bluish, that is to say, uh, Joe has taken the lead in those states, and it's starting to be the emerging consensus that this is more or less the way the map is going to end up, or close enough to be determinative about the outcome, uh, at least on the presidential level. Uh, we'll get into, you know, the other parts of that, uh, but, you know, that's kind of what this country has looked like for a while, is, you know, a lot of red in the middle, a lot of blue on the, on the, on the coasts. Uh, Colorado notwithstanding. Uh, so uh, slide please. Four years ago, well, this is the number of counties in the, in the US. Uh, and, and four years ago, slide please. <clears throat> this was what happened in our, in our last election that, uh, uh, that Trump won 3, 000, over 3,000 of those counties and Clinton won only 57 of those. Well, of course, more people live in those 57 counties than live in those 3,000 counties, but it makes a point, uh, and one about identity, how people identify with their place, and also land. So there's a lot more land in those 3,000 counties. So this is, this is a, a symptom of something. One of the things it may be a symptom of is the, the the dearth of infrastructure in more rural areas. It's just simply more expensive uh, to deliver services, uh, telephone, internet, water, electricity, you name it. Uh, the, the greater spaces, the higher the cost, people have generally less disposable income. And so left to market forces, these trail. I mean, it's true in the US, it's true around the world. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason that, that uh, three and a half billion people in the world are still not yet connected to the internet. So um, we had hoped, and I think closing this gap, focusing on, I mean, there, there are also a lot of people in urban areas that, that lack services, but in rural areas, uh, even more so. And, and a lot of us have been working on how to close that gap in infrastructure and in rural has received a lot of attention. Uh, all that notwithstanding, slide please. Does it seem like the virus is taking a break? <clears throat> Excuse me, or paying any attention to our, our uh, little social interactions as it might look like from the virus standpoint as, uh, as it, almost irrelevant. Uh, it, it presses on, slide please. This is all the, also this morning's uh, number, 121,000 new cases. This is 20% higher than it was at the previous high uh, the day before of 100,000. And it's, and it's, you can see from the curve, it looks like it's gonna be a while before we get, reach this next top with the, everybody's talked about with the, you know, the, the winter season coming on, more people inside, closer together, exposing each other. <clears throat> there's a lot of worry about what this is going to mean. So uh, it's a real test of, of fortitude. It's a test for libraries and how they're delivering services, uh, both physical services and digital services. There's a lot of heroic work going on out there by libraries who are responding to uh, dramatic increases in demand for uh, all kinds of content. Uh, well, digital content mostly. Uh, slide, please. The virus, of course, is not our only crisis. Uh, we're obviously, the, the planet is heating up and, uh, and that's triggering all kinds of uh, traditional disasters, normal disasters, maybe we would call them, uh, in terms of storms and, and fires and floods and 
you know, so yet another crisis. We've this year has been just a cascade of crises, the social justice crisis still going on. Of course, this is the this is the overwhelming crisis that really has to be addressed. These others are going to continue to shrink by comparison. Slide, please. Now, how we do all uh, deal with this connectivity uh, that remains to be seen. This is a map of of uh, the uh, Starlink, the Elon Musk plan to circle the planet with small satellites in low Earth orbit to deliver uh, connectivity everywhere on the planet. I mean, who's to say he can't do that? Uh, I'd be the last one to say what he can or can't do, but uh, <clears throat> even so, even if he does, it'll, it'll still be his data or it'll run through his servers. And that's a tremendous amount of power uh, that maybe we're reluctant to uh, give, though mostly we've already given that away and in all the other various providers we have. So let's get to the program today. Slide, please. Uh, so where are we going? Uh, this year is thankfully winding down and, and we've got a new one and uh, looks like a new administration, a uh, new Congress what looks something like the old Congress. Uh, how is that all going to be negotiated? Uh, there, there's been so much talk for so many years about a major infrastructure bill. It just has escaped uh, consensus. Uh, I mean, when you get to the details, it really matters where and what kind of, uh, what kind of infrastructure project, who gets to do it for how much, uh, and it seems to fall apart at that point. But now maybe we'll get something. It's been predicted. Um, we have with us two outstanding, uh, uh, I, would, I would almost say uh, gurus of, of policy in Washington, D.C., especially as it applies to connectivity <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, connectivity policy and politics. Blair Levin uh, with the Aspen Institute headed the FCC's uh, uh, National Broadband Plan Development uh, 11 years ago now, Blair, it's hard to believe, but nevertheless, that plan called for a number of things. There were five or six uh, major recommendations. The one that we've been most focused on was the one that dealt with connectivity to uh, libraries and uh, schools and other anchor institutions, <coughs> calling for a gigabit connectivity to uh, anchor institutions in every community. And, it, and it's to us, that was the one goal that was really in the control of the FCC. The others were more or less market stimulation kind of goals. But that one goal seemed like it was something that the FCC could accomplish almost entirely on its own through its own policies, principally under the Universal Service Fund. We're still working on that. John Windhausen, uh, the executive director of the Schools, Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition, uh, founded this coalition around that very moment in, uh, at the beginning of the, of the Obama administration when we were looking to do big things. John has built an extraordinary uh, organization in DC advocating for anchor institution connectivity and uh, to and through uh, anchors is the, uh, is the motto, both connecting them with high performance, reliable, uh, affordable uh, broadband, and then how to extend that connectivity through those institutions out into the communities as we talked about either uh, as, as interconnect points for wired and, uh, or wireless uh, uh, extensions. So we're, we're lucky to have both of these fellows with us today. And so we'll turn it over to Blair at this point to tell us what he thinks about what's going on, what he sees in his crystal ball. Uh, Blair also, uh, it's an it's a overly uh, brief introduction of, of Blair's background, but Blair also has spent quite a bit of time on Wall Street and brings a certain, uh, I don't want to say ethic, but perspective to uh, these uh, ideas about deploying uh, broadband for everybody. So Blair, welcome and, and take it away. Thank you very much, Don. Um, I'm going to, uh, first, first of all, I'm actually at Brookings these days, not Aspen, but that's think tanks or, you know, a dime a dozen in DC, I guess. Um, uh, what, what I'd like to do today is actually speak kind of wearing my Wall Street hat. In other words, I'm going to give you the same kind of advice that I give uh, institutional investors 
uh, about what the state of play is. And I thought what I'd do is just go through kind of major players that are gonna affect the environment in which the kind of goals you all have talked about and desire, um, kind of what are their priorities? We'll go through the White House, the Congress, the FCC, um, uh, and then industry, which of course is a major stakeholder. There, there are others, but let's just go through that. First, in terms of the White House, um, top priority, getting COVID under control, can do a lot of that through administrative uh, functions um, where the Senate is, is, is not as important. Secondly, the economic recovery uh, related to coming from COVID, that does require a lot of, that does require congressional action. And of course, one of the big question marks is, what is Mitch McConnell gonna do? Is he gonna do the same thing that he did at the beginning of the Obama administration and just signal, um, I don't care if the economy is bad as long as you're a one-term president. Um, and I don't think I'm being a partisan in saying that. I think that's the record's pretty clear on that. We'll talk more about the Congress in a second. Um, a third thing is what you might think of as some big infrastructure things. Those also require Congress. Uh, there's infrastructure itself, which is um, politically the most bipartisan. And then there's climate change infrastructure. Um, but I think both of those, again, we'll talk about them more with Congress, are opportunities to get the kind of funding that you all have talked about. Uh, another priority is to rejigger the tax system to be fairer. That's actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think most people are now, Wall Street's reaction is certainly that the Biden tax plan is dead. I'm not quite as sure about that. Uh, it depends on how the House does it. It depends on how the Senate does it. But my, my point is, there's a pretty strong bipartisan consensus about certain kinds of rejiggering. Uh, but having said that, they're probably right that moving uh, the, the White House priority of moving corporate taxes from 21 to 28 percent. That probably doesn't happen. Uh, and that's why Wall Street was up the first four days of this week. There's something which you might think of as the equity agenda. Um, th this would go to voting rights, the police reform, but also very importantly for these purposes, digital equity and inclusion. We can talk more about that. Um, but I think that's going to be a big part of the White House agenda. But Everything that the White House does, and this is kind of in summary, is that they have to think of a strategy where it can still work, even if the Senate doesn't do anything, even if the courts might overturn almost anything, because the courts are now very, very different than they were four years ago, not just at the Supreme Court, but in the Court of Appeals. And uh, you're not looking at a bunch of jurists who... Um, you know, have what you might think of as your ju judicial philosophy, rather, and again, you can say I'm being biased, but if you look at some of the decisions, it's very clear, they are choosing winners and losers. They are not calling balls and strikes. And that makes it difficult for an administration um, to position how you do certain things on climate change and other kinds of regulation. Um, uh, and so uh, everything they do, they have to think about, are we going to try to get a couple of R's in the Senate. Um, how do we make it very difficult for courts to overturn certain kinds of actions? So now we move to the Congress. The House is pretty much the same. There's a huge backlog of stuff, including a big infrastructure bill, which they've already passed. Um, uh, so I think that's despite the fact that the Democrats lost a little bit, the fundamental priorities are the same. Uh, the Senate's what's interesting. The single most important thing to understand about the Senate which I don't think people understand yet, is number one, a huge percentage of the Republican Senate caucus is running for president. And they all believe that the path to do that is to get the endorsement of the Trump family. So you'll see Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton doing precisely what, you know, like Ted Cruz did 10 minutes ago, basically saying the election's not over and trumpeting the Trump line and doing all of these things which you know, we can argue about them, I suppose, but um, are clear, or what Lindsey Graham did yesterday, they're, they're clearly designed to keep in the good graces of the Trump family. Um, everyone knows that Trump will continue to be a media presence. And so that's really important. The, uh, and something else that's important is not a single one of them has a legislative accomplishment. That's not what they do. Again, you can accuse me of partisanship. All they have done in the last four years, other than the tax bill, is pass judges. That's it. Mitch McConnell said, I've got the most distinguished record as a majority leader since Lyndon Johnson. His only record was a tax bill and judges. 
And when you compare that to many things Johnson did, or that were frankly were done under Nixon or done under Eisenhower, I mean, it, it's astonishing that a conservative would think that the passing of judges constitutes a legislative record. But that's our mindset, so that's, that's important. And they learned a very important lesson from Trump. Their voters actually don't care about that. They, n none of them were punished for having a legislative record uh, that was, was not significant at all. The, the one exception that actually is interesting, Susan Collins did much better than people expected. The polls were, main were clearly wrong. She talked a lot about the CARES Act. I actually don't think she had much to do with it, but she was successful in, um, in articulating to the public. That was one case where a legislative record may have made a significant difference. Um, so now let's move to the FCC. Um, uh, uh, almost any, Demo any Democrat, the, 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 the list of Democrats who become chair is actually pretty small, but um, despite speculation of a lot of other names, uh, but all of them would uh, reclassify carriers to be titled to. That's like, not maybe not day one agenda, but it's pretty close to day one agenda. Um, but the question is, what do they do after that? And I think the biggest thing is to address the digital divide and libraries are certainly a part of that, but it's whether you think of it as the homework gap or other kinds of gaps within a home broadband or community broadband or et cetera, that's a big part of the agenda. Um, and then there's some consumer protection things, there's competition things, there's 5G from a different perspective than the Republicans. Um, but I think the digital divide will be the dominant issue um, for the FCC and how they address it. But how you deal with that when you have a USF contribution factor already at 27%, the system, I think of it as having a, four stage, a stage four cancer, um, that's very tricky to do without congressional assistance. So that's maybe the single most important thing in terms of the relationship between what you all want to do, what the FCC is doing and what Congress is doing. Uh, and then finally, let me just say, industry fundamentally wants to be left alone. But the one exception to that, and that ties back to the big theme is, they want universal service fixed. It's a problem for them as it is today. And so industry is asking for Congress to essentially take over the funding of the universal service um, uh, needs. And those needs are growing while the revenue base for universal service is shrinking. And industry knows that that's, uh, that's a big problem. There are other, you know, the uh, priorities, the wireless industry wants more spectrum. Um, you know, the telephone industry, the rural guys want money from Congress to be able to rip out the Huawei equipment and replace it and stuff like that. Uh, but the big thing that ties kind of this together is how do we reform the universal service? How do we bridge the digital divide? Um, and, and of course, libraries play a big piece of that. And with that, let me turn it over to uh, John Winhausen, who knows an extraordinary amount about all these issues. That, that's great, Blair. Uh, so, but let me, let me ask you to go a little deeper on, sure. on, the, on the method or the, or the prospects for reform on USF. You're right about the, the contribution factor. It's, it's way overdue. So you, do you see that happening in Congress or do you see Congress supporting that happening at the FCC? So if, if we go with the latter, where Congress says, you know, just fix the contribution factor. And there have, lots of been, there, there have been lots of proposals to do that. There hasn't been a serious one since, I, I've always thought somewhat jokingly, but actually not, that the only time to fix universal service is between a presidential election and a presidential inauguration, because the <laughs> politics are way too complex. And in fact, that was the last time this was tried. Kevin Martin tried to do it. Um, he tried to do it by, by essentially putting a fee on phone numbers, which, you know, if you look at how phone numbers have grown since then, it actually, you know, would have been effective. I'm not here to argue the merits of it. I will simply note as a demonstration of dysfunctional <laughs> politics that that didn't go through. He didn't even bring it to the floor because his fellow Republican, Rob McDowell, said he wouldn't go along with it. Rob McDowell then spent his next four years at the FCC complaining about the broken universal service system and the contribution factor without ever offering his own proposal because that's the way performative uh, institutions work in Washington, DC. And by that, I'm referring to a book by Yuval Levin 
not a relation, but a very brilliant conservative scholar who has talked about how DC institutions have moved from being formative, actually doing things and forming the character of people who do things to being performative, where it's simply entertainment. Um, and on that issue, uh, the FCC has been kind of more entertainment than, than reality. But the important thing to note is that it would take a two to three year proceeding to fix it, followed by several years of litigation. And the litigation risks are quite significant, particularly because you'll have that at the same time, you'll have litigation going on about Title I and Title II, which feeds into it. So there's a dysfunctional feedback loop. And my point is, if you want to fix it in the next couple of years, Congress has to do something. If you're willing to wait another five years before the 15 million kids who don't have home can't go to school because they don't have in-home broadband, if you're willing to let, let them have another five years where they can't do their homework, not to mention the potential of another year of actually being out of the classroom, then sure, you know, I hope that Congress doesn't do that. But, but you know, uh, if Congress if Congress won't ask, it's going to take the FCC a long time to fix it. Yeah, well, that was that was my uh, that was my point is that if if the pandemic is not driving uh, this Congress to to act to close that gap because you know these kids are everywhere, they're in every district, and and then you know what will it take? Your point about performative is is right on. We've seen this, uh, you know, since Obama was elected, and you made me think there's. I'm, I'm going kind of... to argue with that a little bit. Okay, go ahead. You know, at the beginning, you you talked about your the major thing about the national broadband plan. The national broadband plan had it did a number of other things. <laughs> it wasn't just <laughs> yeah. about the gigabit community acres. I know that was your focus. I understand. I understand. But when you look at the reverse auctions we're doing that are going on right now with with rural, which is you know, that that came through the national broadband plan. First net came through the national broadband plan. The incentive auctions came through the national broadband plan. Uh, there were a number of other other things. And, and by the way, I think two of the most significant things, which it's important for people to understand, policy initiatives are not only about policy. Two of the most significant things that occurred as a result of the plan, not solely as a result, but the, the conversation started as a result of the plan. Comcast Internet Essentials, 8 million Americans connected by virtue of that. That came, um, uh, you know, as, as David Cohen, who really uh, pushed that through with Comcast, has, has talked about, came out of discussions we were having with them about how do we get low-income people connected. And the, the other was Google Fiber, which I think led to a lot of gigabit interest in much faster speed. So um, I do think there's an opportunity to do things that don't always require policy. But it does require policymakers to be asking the right questions and being pressing people for solutions, even if the solution does not require an act of Congress or an act of the FCC. Okay, points, several points taken on that, Blair. Uh, and I didn't mean to, to short the other accomplishments of the FCC, just to focus on yeah, the, the uh, parochial interests of, of uh, uh, the institutions. Uh, but uh, but you made me think of the similarities between what uh, how Obama came in as declaring he was going to unite us and setting yeah. himself up for instant failure because the opposition is, well, no, you're not. We disagree, therefore you failed. <clears throat> and then that seemed to be the position and, and the, the paralysis you described with the Senate was pretty much uh, what happened from then on. And uh, this is kind of the same line we've just heard from Joe, you know, I can work with everybody. We're gonna do it together. So we're just gonna to have to see if in fact, uh, the same strategy works uh, again for the Senate to just obstruct. Uh, we just have to find out. And and it, it is true that the FCC has a tremendous amount of power uh, to act uh, you know, within all these various constraints. The market, of course, has a lot to say about what the FCC does. So yes, uh, Let's let's pick it up with uh, John Windhausen, the Shelby Executive Director. John was there at the very dawn of as as Blair was uh, of the uh, of the Telecom Act in '96 and the advent of universal service and E-rate, etc. So, John, welcome, and uh, tell us what you're seeing in your crystal ball. 
Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Don. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and everybody. Uh, it's always hard to follow Blair. He's always so thought provoking. I want to, I actually typed up some remarks uh, to give and share with you today. I'm tempted to throw them out so that I can engage with Blair as he's so provocative, uh, but I'm, I'm going to stick to my script for a few minutes and then come back to offer some, some thoughts. But Don, I wanted to also recognize your leadership, uh, not just in putting these webinars together, but also being the founding chairman of the Shelby Coalition. Uh, you were there right with me right from the beginning in 2009 when we put Shelby together and really appreciate how you've helped us grow and get to this point. Um, in terms of my uh, opening points, you know, I thought it was pretty interesting that my first point uh, was exactly the same as yours, Don, when you put up that slides talking about the counties uh, and the fact that Trump wins the uh, overwhelming majority of the counties. And the reason that's so relevant is because it does reflect the fact that the rural broadband issue is probably the key um, hook that we're going to need to work on in order to attract a bipartisan coalition of supporters to pass some meaningful broadband legislation. Uh, the Republicans tend uh, to focus on the rural broadband build out as their main uh, priority. And frankly, they tend to say that's where the, uh, the, the, the Trump and Republican voters are in the rural areas. So their focus is to serve those areas. What's interesting is the Democrats don't do the opposite. They don't focus only on the urban consumers. The Democrats are focused on rural and urban together, even though something like three quarters of the people who don't have broadband today are located in urban areas. Um, the Democrats are also interested in building out to rural, partly because the Senate is so rural dominated. Even the Democratic senators are supporting rural broadband build out. Um, so that is perhaps the linchpin of the hopes of getting some uh, uh, significant broadband legislation moving forward. And what was interesting, too, is that you had President Trump talking about broadband infrastructure spending and the interesting dynamic that might have happened if we had moved a bill for it is that the Senate Republicans may have been um, convinced to go along to support the Trump agenda if they had ever come to agreement on a broadband bill, hmm. even though the Republicans fiscally conservatives might not have been too uh, supportive of that. Are they going to retreat now to that, you know, do nothing fiscally conservative, don't want to spend money attitude uh, in the next Congress or um, uh, as, as, as you both said, are they going to still continue to court to those Trump voters who actually do want some broadband infrastructure spending? That's, I think, going to be the key issue. Another opening point uh, to make is this notion of broadband as a utility. And I know it's often said, yes, we should treat broadband as a utility. And, and I agree up to a point. Um, it is fundamental, it is absolutely important, just as electricity, water and sewer and those services, but it only gets you so far. The difference between broadband and the other uh, utilities is that the broadband universe is so diverse and there's so many different technologies and so many different kinds of broadband that are there. It's much simpler to say, okay, pass a rural electrification act and fund electricity out to the home you can't quite do that as easily with broadband because you've got wired services, you've got wireless services, you've got satellite-based services. And so you there's a concern about locking in any particular funding for any particular technology because the marketplace may change. And so that's sort of background to the point uh, that the broadband, solving the broadband digital divide problem is really a multi-dimensional issue. It's not a, a single uh, rifle shot. And that's why you have so many bills that are being introduced. Each of them has merit. They're all trying to address a different component of the problem. Um, and what it means also is that it's very difficult to, to plan. And with all respect to Blair, I mean, he did a great job putting the national broadband plan together, but it wasn't really a plan that you think of like a local community would do, where you would go through and say, okay, you do this and you do that, and that will make sure we got coverage. Um, there does need to, it, it's much more atomistic, the broadband landscape. And so you've got a lot of different factors affecting the process. And then you've got the COVID uh, emergency, which has raised the visibility of broadband for telemedicine and distance learning. Um, 
and all of these members of Congress now, because they're hearing it, it is sort of a twofer for a lot of senators and congressmen and congresswomen, because they're hearing about they need broadband from their constituents, but it's also an opportunity to raise money from the technology industry. So you get a lot of members of Congress who are putting up their own individual broadband bills, striking out a leadership position. Uh, and so it's, it leads to a frenzy of different uh, kinds of bills that are being introduced. So I just typed up, I'm not going to go through bill by bill, but just here's a, a brief list of some of the, uh, the bills that have been introduced to address a wide variety of problems. So there's a bill on public safety. There's dig once legislation. There's uh, provisions to expand the lifeline program to $50 a month subsidy for low income consumers. There is legislation on promoting broadband for Native American tribes and educational broadband service. There are bills to fix the Universal Service Fund that Blair was just talking about uh, and the contribution factor, which I'll come back to. Municipal broadband, promoting Wi-Fi on school buses, allocating spectrum auction proceeds to fund rural broadband build out, extending E-rate to the home, providing more funding for rural health care providers, broadband for higher education students who are at home, reimbursing broadband companies for the expenses of keeping people connected uh, uh, due to COVID, funding to support HBCUs and HSIs and MSIs, Hispanic serving institutions and minority serving institutions, funding for student hotspots directly, the rip and replace bill, and then broadband mapping. And so you've got all these different ideas. You've got a lot of different stakeholders, each pushing a, a variety of agendas. And then you know, what's interesting too, is you see some jockeying by the different government agencies and you know, and they're not supposed to lobby Congress, but they do get asked for their input and all of them want to have a piece of the broadband pie. So you've got Department of Agriculture and NTIA, FCC, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, IMLS, Small Business Administration, veterans, each of them wants to have their own broadband funding program. And so how do you fit all of this together? It's an enormous jigsaw puzzle that is really unorganized right now. And there's, there is no plan. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure there should be a plan, sort of a specific plan, but I think my own, own perspective is that I'm very hopeful that the Biden administration, and it looks like it will be a Biden administration, really tries to develop some boundaries or framework for analysis because you have a lot of these different bills that have been introduced um, and they're so overlapping and there's no way to understand the prioritization of these different ideas at the moment. They're all competing for their own piece of the, to, to get included in the broadband, final broadband bill. Uh, but there is a danger that they're gonna conflict with each other and that they're gonna create an inefficient broadband rollout plan because unless the Biden administration really ought to be the best, uh, uh, you know, if they really want to show some leadership, it'd be great to walk through all of these different pieces of legislation and try to synchronize them more than we have had so far. So we know that there's a broadband, uh, you know, just in general, we know there's a broadband deployment problem. We know there's a broadband adoption problem. And those are the two big categories. Uh, the biggest bill, I think, the one that's received the most attention is Mr. Clyburn's bill, the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act, which passed the House not once, but twice this year. Um, and that proposed a variety of things to address broadband adoption. It has Digital Equity Act included in it, funding for IMLS and libraries. Uh, but there's also $80 billion in broadband funding for, for build out to rural markets. And what's interesting too, is they're still using that $80 billion number that came from a study issued by the Wheeler FCC on its final days in office in January of 2017. There hasn't been an update study yet. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I wonder why, uh, you know, I think we ought to have one, but anyway, the $80 billion is the estimate right now of how much it would cost to get broadband to everybody. Um, and just to put that in perspective, you know, when Shelby was formed, we were all agog about the BTOP program. Well, that provided about $4 billion. And that was, you know, viewed at the time as tremendous progress. So now we're talking about 80 billion. And even if you look at Bernie Sanders' website, you know, he was calling for 150 billion. I don't know where he got that number from, but we're talking about some pretty significant numbers here. Um, and so it's very exciting. But then you've got the COVID relief bills too. And I think the most interesting thing that came out uh, just two days ago 
is that Mitch McConnell announced the day after he was reelected. Uh, and now that it looks like he's going to continue as majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell said he's open to a deal on a COVID relief bill. You know, that's a change of tune from him from a couple of months ago when he was advising the Trump administration not to pass a new COVID bill and not to negotiate a deal with Nancy Pelosi because it would split the Republicans. Now he's willing to deal and includes uh, aid for state and local governments, which was the big hang up. So that uh, prospect for a COVID relief bill uh, could be coming soon. Uh, the Senate comes actually comes back into session next week on a lame duck session, and they have to pass funding for the government by December 11th. So that means there's a chance of a, a, a smaller but significant broadband bill, uh, the, the skinny bill that the House Democrats uh, passed in September would allocate $12 billion to the E-rate program to get E-rate to the home. So that is pretty significant amount of funding, even though it's considered skinny uh, by comparison to 80 billion, it's pretty, uh, you know, I think it was still a negotiating ploy by Pelosi to put a $12 billion price tag on that. We had been talking about four to $5 billion for E-rate to the home, but nonetheless, it's in play. And that is something that might see some action uh, in November, December. But if not, there's prospects for the much larger uh, broadband bill that of the type that Clyburn has put together. Um, and as I said earlier, that's, you know, I think the, the Biden administration is going to have an incentive to try to get a comprehensive broadband bill passed in the first six months of next year because it takes time to build out these networks. So they wanna be able to show the benefits of that build up before the next election. So it gives them something they can crowbot. Now for the same reason, that's why the Republicans may try to be an obstacle and keep that from happening. But if the Democrats pitch it as a rural development, it may be hard for all the Republicans, they may be able to get a few Republicans on board with that. And that's probably gonna be the most interesting strategy to watch going forward. So thanks, John. I'll, I'll pause there and happy to engage with you. Uh, amaz amazing uh, uh, landscape, John, you just painted for us there. Uh, I, I feel like that uh, McConnell didn't want to bring up the COVID relief bill because he didn't want to talk about COVID and didn't want the conversation to be even more about it, just to mm -hmm. delay that because there's just no way it's going to reflect positively on the, on the Republicans or, or the president. Uh, but you uh, you make some you make a great point about uh, kind of principles I would say you know like the principle of, of broadband as a utility or not uh, it is different because as you make the point that you know there's only really room for one sewer system there's only really room for one electric system maybe uh, but there are so many ways to deliver broadband. And, you know, even over the same wires and the same poles and, and wirelessly. So it changes that quite a bit. Uh, there's, I think that uh, the UN has just come out to declare access to the internet as a human right, speaking of principles. I don't know if I'm gonna go that far, but, you know, it's really hard to imagine that anyone can function uh, and be productive in the world today without access to the internet. So are there, are there things like that, that that we can agree on? I say we as a, as a country, as, a, as a, a polity to help us settle some of our, some of our uh, differences around approaches. Well, we could agree on that. And I think a lot of the Republicans would also agree that broadband is a very important value, whether that's called a right or not, that may agree with you. That's probably taking that a little too far. But um, I think there's universal agreement that broadband is important and it's necessary to have it. How you pay for it, I think, is still the open question and how you structure the, the landscape. So it's really interesting that, the, you know, and Blair deserves a lot of credit for this whole reverse auction process that the FCC has been using to award uh, universal service funding in rural markets. You know, and so that's a competitive process that brings the prices down, the cost down. Um, and that seems to be supported by both sides of the aisle uh, as a way to try to encourage that build out. I have a few qualms about 
doing so on a national basis. Uh, it does seem to me that there ought to be a little bit more community involvement in determining how that competitive bidding process operates. And I would love to see the Biden administration provide more funding to state and local governments so that they could do the, the needs assessment and determine on, a, uh, uh, on, on that kind of county by county basis where the broadband exists, where it doesn't exist. And then we'd be in a better position to be able to identify where the resources should go and how much investment would be needed. Good, good. Well, let's bring Blair back into that, uh, this point about, you know, spending. And you mentioned this $80 billion number. It's kind of mind-boggling in the, in the comparison to the $4 billion uh, that VTOP was. But it's not, it's not that much in the context of the trillion-dollar checks that are being written right now. And when, when will sensitivity to real money, you know, reassert itself? Uh, or will it? Or, you know, how is that conversation going to go, Blair? What do you... What do you think? Are we going to be, are we going to become fiscal conservatives all of a sudden now? Or are, are we going to keep trying to just throw money at, at our problems? Um, if I had to bet, I would bet uh, the Republican Senate uh, becomes fiscal conservatives pretty quickly. But uh, I would like to be wrong. And I think there are some ways to get at it. And I think John's right that Rural broadband is one of the most important things. And the great thing about the infrastructure bill is it's, it, you know, old fashioned politics has a bad name, but there's actually a certain value to it when um, everybody gets to bring home the bacon to their constituency. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of negotiating leverage. Um, so we'll see whether that happens. Uh, I, I never thought it would happen under Trump because Trump's basic attitude toward infrastructure was state and local government should spend all the money and I should get all the credit. That is precisely the opposite of how you would get an infrastructure bill through. So I think that Biden is particularly well suited to figure out and his team figure out how to do that. Let me just mention a couple of other uh, quick points. One of the problems we had with the national broadband plan was that in 2009 and 10, when we were writing it, number one, there wasn't the kind of political capital you have for getting broadband everywhere that you now have. And COVID deserves some of the credit. And also broadband's more important than it was 10 years ago to the economy, to society, et cetera. Secondly, when we were doing the plan, the money was already spent. So the, the White House basically said, whatever you do, just don't ask for any money because the Recovery Act is, is gone. So everything we had to do had to be in the context of um, policies that didn't cost more, more money. And then finally, as to the 80 billion, I do think it's important to understand that number was what would it cost in 2017 to get basically a fiber capable network to every premise in the United States. And one of the things it said, it said to get from 86%, where it said you know, 86% have it today, to get from 86 to 98%, that would cost 40 billion. And the last 2% would cost an additional 40 billion. And I think that there, there is some wisdom to saying, look, uh, let's not shoot for 100% today. Let's shoot for a big number. Let's get, you can say 95, you can say 96, 97, 98, but let's, let's shoot for whatever we can do. But given the kinds of technologies that John has already talked about that are coming online, let's do this in various steps. It may be that for purposes of the last 2% of the premises, actually, you know, Leo's are sufficient and stuff, but you know, you really, uh, there are these trade-offs about do you spend it on this or do you spend it on that? And do you spend it on a gigabit, but you then only get up to like 92% or do you spend it on technology that gets you hundred symmetric, but you get the 98%. There are all these trade-offs and John was saying this in a way, you know, it would be good to have a rational policy in which the trade-offs were well understood um, and in which we're not simply having kind of performative politics in which people say, I'm great because I'm calling for more when there's zero chance that that more is ever actually um, a delivery. Hmm. So you touch on a, a point about uh, speed, you know, price for speed and, you know, speed for what? And it seems like only in the last few years has uh, uh, HD video, you know, entered the frame which changes the equation completely. I mean, we do all these things with, you know, just a couple of megabits. You can do a lot of mail and text, all these normal things. But once you jump up to, 
to video, you need you need speed. And of course, now everybody is doing what we're doing today, and and uh, so it, it changes that. And you make a good point about trying to reach the last few percent. I mean, there, there are people out there that don't have electricity, I think, you know. That's right. They don't cars, have water right? and stuff like that. So, you know, you have to make those uh, trade-offs. John? Well, I would uh, draw a little bit different emphasis. I think broadband should be available to everybody. And I think we can make that commitment to do that now that we've got uh, satellite service that might be more effective uh, and cost effective. It's still a little expensive at $99 a month is what Starlink is proposing to, to charge for its satellite, but it's going to be a significant improvement over geostationary satellites. So I think we ought to shoot for the 100, bil uh, I'm sorry, 100% availability. That's not to say we should shoot for 100% adoption. I think looking back at the FCC's records, I think the high point for telephone service penetration was 96%. And there are some people who may just choose not to be on. And I think we should respect that choice. But most of the people would benefit by being connected and they need the digital literacy skills and they need the training. So I would say for adoption, 96% goal would be important for us to try to achieve. And I actually um, maybe would suggest that we need to, to uh, up front our uh, goal here to try to make this happen more quickly. I don't think we, uh, like we had a 10 year national broadband plan, which was great. And we made a lot of progress in 10 years, but we didn't fully get the job done. And now we're suffering the consequences as COVID is wreaking havoc. And a lot of people don't have broadband and some, some school districts were finding 40 to 50% of, of the students don't have broadband at home. And that's a real shame. I mean, that leads to educational inequity. So I think we ought to have a, a, a really more specific goal to solve this problem within the next five years. And I think we ought to, the Biden administration ought to set that as its target. And, and I think that can be done building off of the, the work that we've done over the last 10 years, but let's get this, uh, let, let's get this accomplished. Let's declare mission accomplished in five years. So yeah, broadband to everybody. Okay, I'm good with that. Uh, Blair touched on the mechanics of getting this stuff done. You know, this is a day of politics. So, you know, he mentioned that we used to do, uh, I think the term was log rolling uh, in the old days. We don't hear that much anymore. You know, trading, you know, you know I'll support your bill, you support my bill. Uh, and there was a mechanism that was used called earmarks. And it seems like earmarks have been uh, in, uh, you know, disrepute over the last decade, maybe. Uh, is there any way to bring that back or do we even want that? Hmm. I'll put that to both of you. Well, that, that I'll, I'll take a stab, uh, but you know, it is really interesting because the earmarks, it, it sounds bad to the, to the general public, but it really was the oil that got a lot of bills passed and getting earmarks uh, was a way to get votes uh, for legislation. If you can direct funding to particular counties or states so that those congressmen or women needed that funding. That was that was a way to to grease the skids to get more things done. And uh, I think done. that we've lost that. It, it, I think, point, well, it's more go ahead. No, I'm sorry, just one last point. I if I recall there were studies about the economic um, harm from earmarks and it wasn't that significant that it, it, it doesn't sound good, but actual it, it helped um, not just get things done, but the actual economic dislocation was pretty small. Well, I, I think there's a dislocation to Blair's point that it's mo we've moved from uh, uh, productive to performative. And productive, like we, I got this you know, road project for our district, is not as effective as uh, just a rhetorical uh, position uh, you know, in, in performance politics. So maybe the people that have, have denied these, uh, 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 th this tool for, for trading or swapping uh, don't really value that. Uh, they, can, they can win without it, in other words. Blair? No, I, look, John has much better experience on Capitol Hill, which is where the log rolling occurred. Um, uh, we, we, we didn't have the opportunity to do that much log rolling in my two stints at the FCC. Um, 
but uh, but uh, but I completely agree with that, and I think that that's a, an infrastructure bill is particularly well suited to that. Um, but we'll see whether we can pull it off. Uh, I, I you know Mitch McConnell has a big decision to make about whether he actually wants the economy to get uh, to get the kind of stimulus that the conservative Republican Jay Powell, head of the Fed, who worked in the Treasury Department under Bush, was a you know a Wall Street banker type, um, and he says we need a lot of fiscal stimulus. And um, Mitch McConnell can either say yes, or he can say no. What we need is for Biden to be a one-term president. What's Mitch going to do? I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a big one. And it's not uh, just Mitch, right? I mean, it's like right. It's the failure of you know Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio say we need a new populist kind of Republican Party. Well there's no evidence that they're actually introducing legislation or dealing with people, but, but you know, these guys could surprise us. I, I do think we're in a moment of tremendous political potential political shift here. Uh, we've got a question uh, asking whether either of you would be willing to serve as a FCC chair. Could I jump on that, Don? Good because welcome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. I just want to say for the record that I would be very, very happy to nominate Blair to be the FCC chair. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. So I, I uh, thank you, John. I, I deeply appreciate that. I, I was going to nominate you. Uh, look, there, there's, a, there's a list that the press writes about that I often show up on. Um, that's not really, that's not the real list. There is a real list. <laughs> I think I know who's on it. Um, uh, and they're, they're great folks. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm confident that whoever Biden picks will be a person, you know, when we're talking about the agenda that John and I are talking about, that's gonna be a really important agenda to, agenda to any of the, let's call them four or five people that I think are on the real list. Um, they're all people who are, I think, generally well known to this audience, um, and they, they know the institution, they know the job. So let's hope. Uh, but you know, that's an, another interesting question, which is uh, putting aside the two sitting Democratic commissioners, does the Biden administration want to pick someone who would have to go through a confirmation hearing, knowing that McConnell can hold that up for a long time? So that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Is it is it one of those appointments you can make acting and and no you have to no. get you have to get to the commission you can appoint one of the sitting Democrats as the interim chair uh, but but to, to get to the commission. commission you can't you can't be an acting though it's interesting McConnell is saying he's not going to pass certain cabinet people well you know Trump didn't get a lot of approvals I wonder whether Biden just goes hey Mitch we'll just we'll just have acting people forever. I'm, I'm not going to play that game, but that doesn't sound like Biden. So, you know, we'll see. It doesn't sound like fun either. Uh, no. John, you said the connect, you thought connectivity was important and I believe you used critical. Would you go as far as essential? I mean, I'm trying to come up with a term here that, that would get us to uh, prioritizing this to the level that it really deserves. Our view is it's an essential service. And as such, it, it deserves, you know, ultimate priority. And how does that, in, in either of your perspectives, how does all this fit into sustainability and this green agenda? And will that, will that really drive the infrastructure conversation or be kind of what it's been for, the last, for decades now, a kind of a background conversation or a side conversation? Well, I mean, broadband, I'm sorry if I created confusion, broadband is absolutely essential. Uh, and I totally agree that it's an essential service. Everybody should have access to it. It should be available to 100%. Um, and I think, Don, you were the one who coined this phrase that I really like, that broadband is a meta infrastructure. It's not just an infrastructure on its own, and it is, but it also facilitates better transportation, smart transportation. It's, it, it creates smart grid and more efficient energy production. Uh, it allows, uh, improves the educational system. Um, uh, it improves a lot of, it, it will have an impact on climate change in a positive direction. 
So the investment that you're making in broadband, even though $80 billion sounds like a big number, it really pays enormous dividends, not just for the short term for getting broadband, getting people connected, but it has huge benefits for all of the other industries to make our economy work better. Uh, well, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, because as, compared to all of our traditional infrastructure, our telecom infrastructure is tiny in terms of the cost of, of deploying it. And you're right, we're, you know, we're heading into the age, we're entering in the age of smart infrastructure, smart sewers, smart everything. So we're doing that for all the productivity gains and cost savings that can go along with that, but it also introduces complexity because then you start to have interdependencies between your electrical system, your communication system, your, your communication system and your water system. There's a vulnerability that goes along with that. So you have more vulnerability and complexity as the mm -hmm. offset for the, you know, the benefit savings. And the, the challenges at the community level where most, a lot of these infrastructure projects actually happen is the, the people that have, have experience in letting out contracts for asphalt and so forth, they, they've been doing that for, since they were in diapers. But you start talking about ICT, information communication technology, they go, no, no, we don't do that. That's Irving over in the, in the computer shop that, that does that. So there's a real gap in knowledge needed to make these kind of decisions. But, uh, but I take your point. Um, we Can are, I... go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, Don. Can I just interject and, and turn to Blair for one other question? Because I'd love to get his take on, on uh, the Wall Street's view of 5G. Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about 5G solving the world's problems, and it seems to have this great potential to provide unlimited connectivity. And yet I've also heard some uh, technology uh, engineers say, depending on how you deploy it, 5G may be slower than 4G. Uh, because it's a different way, uh, you, you've got to engineer it in such a different way, and it, it, it's costly to get all of those um, uh, devices installed and engineered so that they're actually can take maximum advantage of that theoretical efficiency. So I'm, I, I tend to see 5G as primarily a business-to-business -business service that will help in the in dense, not just urban, but the most densely populated components of the urban areas. Uh, that's where the money is. I'm not sure whether 5G is going to get out to rural markets for many years, but I wonder if Blair has a view on that. I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a couple of things. First of all, in terms of, there is a huge disparity between what Wall Street thinks and what inside the Beltway people think about 5G. Um, to the inside the Beltway crowd, 5G is the next great miracle, you know, estimates of 20 million jobs or, you know, what, all these new industries, all these things, there, there, there's no, Wall Street does not believe that. Wall Street believes that there are some use cases in the enterprise. Primarily Wall Street believes, at least as far as based on my conversations, that the industry has to go to 5G, but it's not really about the speed as much as it is about the capacity. Because when you're doing video and you're doing a bunch of other things like, like this, you know, speed's important, but so is latency. And so is uh, having just bigger bandwidth so that you can have a lot more bits, which is, which is a different criteria than, than speed. So you're replacing a more constrained network with those bigger bits. And there's, there's a lot of operational savings. So over time, it's a valuable thing, but in terms of the consumer market, there is no product yet where, Wall, as far as I know, Wall Street believes industry could actually be able to charge more for a 5G service other than through branding, which is not, you know, nothing. But, the, you know, Verizon was charging more for 5G and then they actually cut back because they, they, they weren't selling it because no one's interested in buying a service, which as far, you know, as far as you can tell, has no difference in how it plays out. Now, by the way, there is actually one commercial mass market service that 5G could facilitate. Nobody wants to talk about it. I'm not talking about pornography, which is also true uh, and is always true whenever a new technology like communications technology comes along. I am talking about online real-time sports gambling. 
you you can see a business case there for 5G phones. But we don't, and you know, 10 years from now, it'll be one of the biggest businesses in America, and will also be one of the biggest social problems we have in the country. But let's, we don't need to talk about that here. <laughs> but, but, but 5G is seen very, very differently on Wall Street. I don't think that there's any bump to, to T-Mobile or Verizon or at t stock because Wall Street is betting on a great 5G outcome. I, I should mention this. There is one other thing. There is, there's an interesting debate on Wall Street about whether 5G will allow wireless to essentially replace cable in the home. Cable is really taking great broadband share. DSL is going to nothing. Um, fiber is only going to about 30% of American homes. So recently there have been some increases and that's important. That's a big debate on Wall Street. But the other one is whether 5G will essentially be the thing that really challenges cable in the home. Reasonable minds can differ about that. I can tell you my views, but I don't think my views are um, that that important, but that's where the debate is. Yeah, that's a good point, and I, I think uh, John also alluded to, you know, how far out does five G go, and right. your, all your remarks refer to it in, as you know very high speed. Uh, but when you actually put the, the carriers on the spot, they say, "Oh, we well, we have we have we have high band, we have mid band, we have low band to suit the circumstance." So. What they really mean is they're going to do the same thing they're doing now, only in the, the dense markets where they think they might or they thought they would be able to mine more uh, revenue from the uh, urban markets. Uh, but I don't think they've had any real plan to do millimeter wave uh, uh, systems in rural areas. I, don't, I haven't heard anything like that. Um, hey, Don. One, yeah. I, I have one interesting point uh, to make, uh, to share before I have to log off for another webinar. Uh, but since Blair mentioned sports betting and sports gambling, I thought I'd share, I, I went on one of the sports gambling sites recently and they have already have posted odds for the 2024 presidential election. Who do you think is uh, ranked first and second? I'll give you the Trump answers. And, Trump and Harris. Uh, almost. Her Kamala Harris is number one, has the best betting odds. Number two, Nikki Haley, uh -huh. not a sitting U.S. senator. So to Blair's point about all the current Republican senators running for re-election or for, for the presidency, they've got a significant challenger uh, who isn't burdened by having a record. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. No, I'm not sure. That, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. However, having said that, she is a very uh, compelling political figure. Uh, but she, yeah. you know, there, there, there are certain things like literally what is happening now, where it, it's hard to say that she is standing up for democracy mm. and the Constitution. Thanks, John, for bringing us back to the point of the day and the timing of the day of you know politics and. Uh, uh, final remarks. I, I think we're at our hour, and uh, John, you you have the floor. Any anything else you'd like to add? Well, if you don't mind me, instead of providing a big uh, flowery conclusion, I have one really practical uh, question for all of your audience members, uh, or really request. So I mentioned the broadband mapping bill is in the works, and of course, Congress passed the Broadband Data Act earlier this year. Uh, directing the FCC to improve the broadband maps, but the FCC didn't, I'm sorry, Congress did not provide the funding to the FCC to actually collect the data and, and do the maps. So they're still uh, looking for congressional appropriations in the next couple of months. And one of the reasons I'm so interested is because the FCC staff is, uh, and proposal does not include anchor institutions. They're not proposing to map the broadband for libraries and schools and healthcare providers. They've you know, gone this traditional route to dividing the broadband maps between business and residential. So Shelby is going to be making an effort to try to convince legislators to say, to condition the award of that funding, only give the FCC the funding to implement the broadband maps if they are also agreed to map the, the anchor institutions. So I'd love for anybody on the call who's interested in working with us uh, with Shelby and me to, you know, please drop me a note 
and say we'd love to to be able to work with you to try to see if we can convince Congress to make that little change. Is is there a, a place on the on the website at Shelby.org for people to find that or find you? Ah, you know that's a good point. We should put a page up. We haven't done that yet, but uh, that's a great idea, John. But uh, Don, but they can uh, contact me directly at jwindhausen at shlb.org. Okay, well, good point, very practical. Uh, a lot to be done, and as the world takes on the new shape. Uh, Blair, you're gonna get the last word today. Uh, the last word is fasten your seatbelts. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's about 75 days till the inauguration. That will be an extraordinary period. Um, uh, and then the first 100 days are gonna be extraordinary. So uh, for those of you who are exhausted by the events of this week, have a great weekend and then <laughs> and then get ready for a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. Saddle up. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, you know, we we haven't really resolved that much. Uh, so it's just more of this until we somehow figure out how we're going to how we're actually going to be able to bring this country together around these priorities that are just inescapable. Thank you both so much for being uh, with us today. This has been this has been a lot of fun and and a lot of insight. Uh, and please come back. Great, great That's to see you, John. Thank you so much. And John, Thank good you. to see so, you as well. Same here, so Blair. We'll wrap that up. I, but before you go, uh, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute if they would, please unmute. Because we'd like to uh, we'd like to give our our, our guest uh, a round of applause, please. Everybody, please. Aloha. <clears throat> All right. Very good. Come back next week.